Hi, this is Chris Lohman from the Department of Energy, and I want to welcome you all to the webinar today. Um, it's going to be presented here by uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I wanted to just quickly frame this for you all. As we all know, one of the largest obstacles that we face in driving energy efficiency into uh, the residential market is creating the demand, pulling people through a process of making them aware of energy efficiency and its benefits, educating them on how to access it, and then driving them to action. One of the largest sectors that we have to be concerned with is the middle income sector. It's the heart of the market, the heart of the, uh, the number of houses out there, the kilowatts that can be saved, and the folks who are both able to act because of their, their, um, their resources, but also a lot more leery and a lot more um, hesitant to become early, early adopters simply for um, aspects other than the real strong value proposition. And so Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has done a lot of work in this area, worked with a lot of folks who have been pioneers in this area, learned a great deal about it, and we're very excited that they're going to share with us today um, and through the publication of this paper a lot of the insights that, that they've been able to gain. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Marian Borgeson over at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, it's been great to work with DOE on this project. Um, it, it's so relevant to, to so many of the programs out there, both stimulus-funded programs and other efficiency pr programs. Um, before we get into the kind of the meat of this webinar, I just want to let everyone know that we will have additional webinars on this topic that really dive into some of the key issues that we will touch on today. And these are the future webinars you see on your screen. We'll have um, examples so folks who are actually in the field doing this work talk about their programs. So today will be kind of an overview of the key themes from the paper. Um, you can find the, the full report at middleincome.lbl.gov. Um, and then we'll be diving into um, all, the, all the topics you see on your screen in greater detail at these webinars uh, that we've already scheduled. <clears throat> I've also just sent out a note to the group saying that the slides and audio for this um, program will be available at middleincome.lbl.gov next week. And anyone who registered for this webinar will get an email um, with that link as soon as it's available, so it will just come right to you. Um, so let's just let's just dive right in. So in terms of the main topics that we're going to cover today, um, we will go over. I'll go over briefly the research question and the methods. Um, we'll talk about who these folks are. Um, so what is our definition of middle income characteristics of that market? We'll look at driving demand in this market. We'll look at building stocks, structural issues, um, and also access um, to capital. And then we'll finish off with the role of policy. Um, throughout the whole session, um, you'll be able to ask questions through the question box on your screen. It should be on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll be moderating those questions and asking them verbally of um, our presenters as we go. Um, if there's any questions kind of left at the end that seem appropriate for sort of follow-up, more general questions, we'll have all of those at the end. But I'll ask sort of the um, clarifying questions along the way as we go. So really feel free, um, as the speakers are talking through these different topics, uh, to uh, ask questions um, as they come up for you. So just in terms of the motivation for doing this work and some of the, the methods behind um, the research that we present today and in the longer report that's online, um, we were really interested in how we can reach much larger groups of people than um, what programs are currently doing. We know that um, low-income folks are, are being served by often, oftentimes free weatherization programs. And then there's this whole other swath of people that kind of voluntarily and choose to invest their own money with support from programs uh, into improvements for their home. And what we wanted to know is for middle income households, were their barriers different? Um, who are these folks? What did they look like? Were they getting access to capital? Basically, were they getting what they needed to help them participate in, in large numbers in efficiency programs across the country? And for this, we really talked extensively with program administrators, policymakers, researchers, and contractors who serve this market or were trying to serve this market. We looked at case studies of programs, and in fact, a report includes six case studies plus examples from many other programs. Um, some of those case studies will be highlighted at our future webinars. Um, and then we looked at re relevant reports and present, uh, presentations on the characteristics of who these folks were, and basically tried to get our hands on any of the relevant demographic, housing, energy use, and financial data that we could find. So we can kind of inform um, who these folks are, how we could best access them, and what policies might be um, used, need, needed to improve um, penetration into the middle income market. So today we're going to have um, two researchers from Lawrence Berkeley Lab talk to you. 
um, Ian Hoffman is going to start talking about the um, middle income um, characteristics, what that um, segment looks like. And then we'll have uh, Mark Zimmering from the lab um, talk about driving demand, building stru structural issues, access to capital. And then Ian will um, um, bring up the, the end, talking about the role of policy and wh where policy might fit into the picture here. So right now I'm just going to turn it over to Ian and um, have him kick us off. Thanks, Ian. Hi, thanks, Mary. And, uh, first off, let's, let's just uh, talk briefly about what, uh, what kind of bills uh, middle-income households are facing. And we're projecting that uh, these households are going to spend, uh, for 2011, about $80 billion on, uh, on home energy. And uh, these, uh, in, in, in terms of their overall household expenditures, it's a very small percentage, actually. It's, you know, on average, about 4% for, for a median income household. But it's, it's pretty significant when you look at it in the context of other household expenditures. And so we're talking about you know, more than half of, of what's being spent on eating at home. And you know, uh, more than uh, roughly uh, 1 and, and 1.4 times what uh, is spent on all clothing in the household. Uh, so it's very significant. Next slide. If you will. And so uh, the uh, the way we've defined this market, I, I, if you if you ask anthropologists and sociologists, they're going to define the middle class as including 70 percent of the population. Uh, what we were interested in is is really looking in a much more specific way at a, at at this uh, population that uh, is is as uh, Marion said, kind of not addressed through low income programs. And so we're our range here is, is kind of households that earn between 32,500 and 72,500 and just for perspective you can see how uh, you know because of cost of living uh, that uh, kind of the middle income segment kind of varies uh, from uh, from place to place um, but uh, we uh, we set it here in part for some data reasons in part to uh, to, to get a firm grip on on consumption uh, you know and who are we uh, who are we really talking about here? These middle-income uh, households, you know, these are nurses, teachers, truck drivers. We really we looked at what kinds of uh, occupations had high concentrations uh, of, of middle-income householders, and so a lot of retail salespeople, government workers, mid-level office staff uh, in uh, the professions and in in business, um, and uh, so the. Um, uh, moving on to kind of the housing stock where you will find these households, it's uh, it's overwhelmingly um, you know uh, single family home owners. We've got 83% uh, of uh, of middle income households are living in single family homes, and that includes duplexes and quads, and about two thirds are own own their own homes or apartments. Next slide. And, uh, and so, if you look at the entirety of uh, middle-income households, you know a, a significant percentage do qualify for uh, weatherization programs. But if you're just looking at the single-family uh, segment, that percentage drops way down and uh, uh, to really just six percent of, of those households. So we're really talking about uh, folks who are primarily, overwhelmingly served by voluntary programs, uh, non-low-income programs. So on average, and this is, it kind of speaks to the opportunity here, middle-income households are living in older homes uh, that tend to be leakier and, and have uh, some, some other issues that Mark's going to get into a little bit later. And they tend to stay in those households, in those homes, much longer than, uh, than uh, their higher income peers. We're talking, uh, you know, at least a decade, often much longer. Uh, and it, 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 one of the bright spots that we found was that, uh, you know, partly because they're staying in these households longer, these households are spending a lot on their own homes. They're investing quite a bit. In, uh, in 2008 and 2009 combined, they spent, uh, you know, almost $84 billion. And about, you know, 18.2 of, of this spending, about $1 in every five, was potentially uh, energy related and and by that we mean uh, that uh, we're talking about 
uh, insulation replacement or repair of insulation, roofing, central uh, heating and air conditioning. Um, if we included major built-in appliances such as dishwashers and hot water heaters, you would get to one dollar in every four uh, would be spent on potentially energy-related issues. And now I want to note that you know that uh, you know a significant portion of this uh, spending is spent on uh, roofing repairs. About ten ten billion is spent on roofing repairs. Um, but uh, and if you just look at insulation, which is really uh, you know the only expenditure that we can assert explicitly reflects an intent to save energy, it's about a billion uh, of this. But what these numbers suggest, kind of larger picture, is that there is a big opportunity out there, and um, and one way of accessing that opportunity is kind of nudge households into into using more efficient materials and equipment, and then encouraging them to kind of build on those basics over time. So let me turn it back over to Mark to uh, to cover kind of how, uh, our ideas on driving demand in this market. Great, thanks very much, Ian. So just to recap what Ian covered. Uh, the majority of middle-income households are single-family homeowners. Uh, the vast majority of these don't qualify for public assistance programs. Their homes are older than those of their of their higher-income peers, suggesting that they represent great opportunities for energy efficiency. And the savings from energy improvements have the potential to meaningfully impact uh, their household budgets. And so the question that we face is, why aren't they investing in mass? Uh, and, and what we found in the report is that financial strain and the risk of investing in a product with benefits that are perceived as uncertain uh, make efficiency a really tough sell for middle-income households. These households face a variety, a variety of, of challenges. Uh, for many, energy use just simply isn't a high priority. Uh, for those who it is a priority for, uh, energy upgrades have both perceived and real performance risks. How do these customers know that they'll save money or increase the value of their homes? Uh, in the face of this uncertainty, one of the program managers we interviewed, Todd Conkey from, from WEC, suggested that in a bad economy, many people would rather pay a few dollars more per month on their utility bills than have a six to $10,000 loan hanging over their heads while they're worried about keeping their jobs. Next slide. Great. So I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar uh, with the report that we published in 2010 on driving demand for home energy improvements. If you haven't read it, please visit drivingdemand.lbl.gov. There's a link on the slide uh, for a host of resources. Most of the lessons that we learned from this report and the best practices highlighted in the report are applicable to the middle income sector. But beyond these general approaches, uh, we suggest in this report several tailored strategies for middle income households. And I'll move fairly quickly through those that I think are more familiar to the group. So for example, Using trusted messengers is key to creating efficiency demand. It's important to know that these messengers will often vary across and within income groups. So for middle income households, we think particularly compelling sources of information include friends and relatives, and local nonprofits like uh, community development financial institutions with whom they may already have relationships. Um, it's also important to note that different messages are going to resonate with middle income households. While comfort uh, is a key driver uh, more broadly in the residential sector, middle income households are stressed and we, we need to solve a problem that they recognize. So messages that might be effective include maintaining the value of their homes, uh, typically their largest historical asset and one that they've historically invested in, uh, replacing equipment or solving health safety and structural issues, and I'll talk, talk to these uh, briefly in, in a following slide. Uh, and then of course across all income groups, saving money really matters to folks. Uh, but I'm going to focus the, the next couple slides on, on, on two particular strategies, uh, which are reducing the cost of upgrades and reducing participant risk for, for more comprehensive upgrades. Next slide. So one of the biggest takeaways from our research is that it is simply not realistic, given today's economic and policy environment, to expect some middle-income households to make five to $15,000 proactive, comprehensive energy efficiency investments. And there are several alternatives that we explore reducing the cost of upgrades. Uh, the most promising, I think, being a start with the basics approach, which entails doing the basics today. Uh, th those basics entail air sealing, duct sealing, insulation, uh, at a cost in the range of two to four thousand dollars, and encouraging more efficient choices when households make future replace replacements in the form of furnaces, water heaters, air conditioners, and windows. Uh, the prescriptive approach offers a standard set of measure measures generally expected to to save energy within a given climate region across a, a range of properties. 
Um, and, and this approach can reduce household and program costs by limiting the need for full energy assessments and tailored proposals for each household. And finally, we think do-it-yourself home improvements uh, are, are particularly promising. For middle-income households, they represent about 27% of total home improvement spending that Ian noted earlier. Uh, and there are several pilots being deployed in the market today to explore the cost-effectiveness of sponsoring these programs. Next slide, please. So quick example on the start with the basics approach. Uh, in Arizona, APS and the Salt River Project are, have partnered to offer a home, per, home performance with Energy Start program. Most of the about 4,000 participants last year invested in basic packages of efficiency, an average cost of about 3,000 bucks, and typical savings in the range of 10%. As part of the program, contractors did conduct full home energy assessments, and the program and contractors are hoping that these assessment results will be used as roadmaps for ongoing engagement with households as equipment needs to be replaced uh, so that they're ensuring that there's future energy efficiency investment. I think one of the big questions that this strategy raises is whether households will make sufficient future investments and improvements to achieve deep enough energy savings to achieve our broad public policy goals. We're effectively, in a sense, uh, choosing the most cost-effective measures today and this will inherently reduce the cost effectiveness of future investment opportunities. Next slide. So rather than reducing the cost of the actual upgrade, another approach is to reduce household risk when investing in a larger, more comprehensive upgrade. Uh, and there are a couple strategies for reducing this cost. Uh, one strategy is increasing financial incentives for middle income households. So several programs provide enhanced uh, incentives for these households. Uh, in New York, for example, the home performance with Energy Star offered by NYSERDA uh, offers a standard 25% rebate, but for households earning less than 80% of area median income, uh, that, that incentive jumps to about 50%. Another approach is to offer flexible loan terms that are set to ensure that energy savings exceed loan payments. Um, but the challenge with this is that it may limit the scalability of financing, something we'll talk about later, as lenders really prefer standardized products uh, rather than products whose loan terms float with the, with the specific project. And finally, I think performance guarantees may be a particularly promising approach, but there's very little information on what these will cost in practice, whether we have sufficient technology to offer them, and what their ultimate impacts will be on efficiency, demand, and household behavior. Uh, we think it would be really valuable for guarantees to be piloted in the marketplace. Next slide. So I just want to touch briefly. Hey, Mark, before we um, go on, there's just a, a question um, from a member of our audience. That first slide that you showed in this section, looking, uh, that basically had a quote from Todd saying that, you know, some folks perceive a, a, a loan of $6,000 as being riskier or, or less desirable than um, having higher monthly bills. Can you say a bit more, more, a bit more about that? Seth asked, why do people see the liability of a loan payment as being riskier than having higher utility bills month after month? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, ultimately they're looking at, they, folks have a, a fairly short-term focus today, um, and the idea that monthly payments will be, let's say, $20 higher uh, on, a, on a kind of monthly basis, whether the investment in theory uh, is a rational one or not to, to take out financing and, and kind of benefit from, uh, from reduced energy bills, uh, that high upfront cost, that six to $10,000 loan, uh, in a kind of risk-averse population is very difficult. I mean, I think the, the kind of the other thing to note is that um, energy savings are, in a sense, what, what we're predicting. Uh, and so there's no guarantee to folks uh, that they're going to save money or save the money, the amount of money that we predicted. And historically, while on average energy improvements have performed as we've expected, uh, there's been significant variance between households. And for a lot of households, they can't afford not to save the amount of money they expected to because they won't be able to cover uh, let's say, interest and principal payments. I think also just another um, sort of rational consideration is that if you lose your job, you could, uh, you know, wear a sweater, wear more sweaters, have your kids wear sweaters and just, you know, turn off your heat, whereas you can't not pay that um, loan payment, that's a monthly set amount. So there is more flexibility, you know, hypothetically with uh, how much energy you use. And there's uh, probably, as Mark was kind of alluding to, this sort of perception of debt being a, a burden and something to avoid. And just the other, we'll move on to building stock structural issues, but the, the other thing to think about is that um, folks have fairly limited access to capital today, something we'll touch on in, in uh, some following slides. And so for a lot of them, they're looking to preserve that limited capital access 
uh, for emergency or unforeseen uh, expenditure needs. So another takeaway from the report is that we found that, that many middle-income households have building structure and maintenance issues, including fire and safety hazards, ventilation issues, mold and mildew, and asbestos, some of which need to be addressed either in conjunction with or before efficiency. Um, households are often aware of these problems, but again, in an uncertain economy, they're either reluctant or unable to afford the fixes before the problems turn into emergencies. Uh, addressing these issues as part of an energy upgrade can both create demand and achieve a broader range of, of private and public policy goals. Um, we think three strategies can enhance program capacity to address these issues. So first, allowing non-energy measures uh, as part of an energy efficiency loan uh, may be effective. In Portland, Oregon, for example, uh, participants can use up to 20% of the loan amount for non-energy building issues. Uh, we also think that the, the network of over a thousand weatherization organizations may have the requisite skills and experience relevant to, to addressing both efficiency and building issues uh, at the same time. Um, as Recovery Act weatherization funds run out, uh, fee-for-service business models in the middle income sector may help some weatherization providers to avoid reducing their headcounts. And lastly, many barriers to energy savings and, and potential public benefits are targets of other programs and funding sources, uh, housing programs, economic development agencies, that type of thing. Uh, funding non-energy measures with, with money is targeted for efficiency uh, can raise important questions about, about how you're spending your funds, and there are opportunities to leverage these other sources of capital to pay for non-efficiency intervention costs. Um, in addition, streamlining the delivery uh, of, of existing funds and services can reduce intervention costs and enhance both private and public benefits. So we think that these approaches, these coordinated approaches, can be effective at enhancing household outcomes, but there, there are big challenges to, to scalability. The Green and Healthy Homes Initiative is, is piloting this approach nationally. While early results are promising, I think significant coordination challenges still remain at both the programmatic and, and policy levels. Next slide. So Mark, let me pause here again and just ask a few questions. Um, Mark is asking, uh, not you, Mark, Mark Sadeen, um, is asking, would, do you have any experience that shows performance guarantees increase homeowners' participation in programs? Yes, yeah, so I think it's a great question. There, there's not a lot of data um, on, on the actual impact of, of robust performance guarantees. Um, I think given the research that we've done and, and the profound risk aversion that we've found, particularly in this population, but also really across the residential sector, that were we to be able to kind of cost effectively uh, implement guarantees, they could be very promising in, in driving demand and actually kind of making people more confident that the, that the um, pitches that they're getting about energy savings are actually going to be realized. But there, but there is no hard data, uh, at least that I'm aware of, that suggests that you'll get a doubling or tripling uh, or quadrupling of, of demand as a result of this. That's probably an area where we need some experimentation. We'd be really interested to see that in the field. Yep. We have another question here about the Portland program, the, where they have 20% non-energy measures, um, at least asking where the funding for that comes from. Um, so I can answer that. Um, Portland and the, and the statewide program, Clean Energy Works Oregon, is funded both um, through the um, ratepayer funds, which, which goes through the Energy Trust of Oregon in Oregon, and um, also with stimulus dollars and some uh, uh, additional foundation money as well. Um, in Portland itself, they actually can go up to 40% non-energy measures in certain neighborhoods, and that's through um, local, local Portland-based um, City of Portland redevelopment funds. So if there's, uh, they've targeted certain neighborhoods that they know need additional rehab work, and so they've added additional money um, into the pot to support additional work, up to 40% of the total um, project cost in those neighborhoods. Great, thanks. So once we move beyond demand creation, and it's clear that that's a significant barrier, um, the upfront cost of home energy improvements is, is, is also a significant barrier. Uh, energy efficiency for just a third of middle income households would require an investment on the order of at least $30 billion and potentially up to $100 billion. Uh, and while middle income households have historically invested in maintaining and improving the value of their homes, their capacity and willingness to do so has declined. So in 2001, over half of middle income improvement projects were paid for in cash, uh, and the recession has clearly depleted household savings. And so as folks turned to financing, we found that in 2001, middle income households were more likely than any other income group to pay for improvements using home secured debt. 
I think you can imagine where this is going. Next slide, please. So since peaking in 2006, home prices nationally have declined by, by about a third, 32%. Um, but this data masks more dramatic regional declines and the concentration of these price declines in low, in low and middle value properties. Those might most likely to be owned by middle income Americans. So for example, in Atlanta, uh, you see on the, on the left side of your screen that, that overall, uh, home prices are down by less than a quarter. But when you look at low tier properties, again, those most likely to be owned by middle income households, they're down by almost double that number, 55%. Next slide, please. So without access to, to uh, savings or home secured debt, potential uh, middle income participants in, in energy efficiency uh, programs are turning to unsecured loans that are generally offered by efficiency programs. And these programs are experiencing extremely high applicant rejection rates in the range of 20 to 50%. So in New York, for example, about 48% of applicants are rejected. In Maine, uh, more than 50% rejected. Uh, and worse than this is that middle-income households are rejected at higher rates than their higher-income peers. So in Pennsylvania, through the Keystone Health Program, just 43% of middle-income applications are approved compared to almost 70% uh, for their higher-income peers. Um, but in a sense, if you look at this table, there's also reason for hope. Middle-income households are applying. Uh, almost 40% of applicants are, are middle-income uh, households, and, and almost a quarter of, of participants are middle-income. And we see a similar trend in New York, where about a third of participants in their Home Performance with Energy Star program have historically been uh, middle-income. Next slide, please. So why are middle-income middle -income households rejected at higher rates? Well, credit scores are, are among the key creditworthy metrics that lenders use to evaluate borrowers. And while credit scores do not explicitly take in income into account, middle-income households are likely to have lower credit scores than their higher-income peers. So you can see from this graphic that while just 60% of middle-income households have credit scores of at least 650, generally the lowest approvable credit score for a standard unsecured loan product, almost 80% of higher-income households have approvable credit scores. Next slide, please. It's clear that, that middle-income households need new ways of, of accessing affordable credit. Um, we simply cannot scale efficiency markets in a meaningful way if we're rejecting more than one and two program applicants. But you know, care needs to be taken with regard to who is given access to credit and, and what claims are made about the benefits of efficiency improvements. Underwriting criteria ultimately exist for a reason, and that's to ensure that those that get access to, to capital are, are willing and able to repay it. And so, for example, when we look at uh, likelihood of loan delinquency, it more than doubles uh, in the credit score cohort from 600 to 649 compared to the credit score cohort just above it from 650 to 699. So there's a reason that these underwriting criteria exist. Next slide. So now that we've defined the problem, let's discuss some strategies for increasing capital availability. Um, and these include credit enhancements for lenders, alternative underwriting criteria, and innovative financing tools. So credit enhancements in, in the form of loan loss reserves, subordinated debt, and, and guarantees reduce lender risk by sharing in the cost of losses in the event of loan default. Loan loss reserves are by far the most common form of credit enhancement, which lenders can recover losses from a pool of funds in escrow up to a fixed percentage of the overall portfolio of loans they make, typically in the range of 5 to 10%. Loan loss reserves are generally structured so that a lender must absorb a fixed portion of each loan default to ensure it's appropriately, mo appropriately motivated to lend responsibly. Typically, these reserves are used to reduce interest rates for borrowers that already have access to capital. Uh, but for example, in the Recovery Act funded Milwaukee and Madison, Wisconsin program, they've actually expanded capital access by structuring the reserve um, such that it allows the city's financial partner to recover more funds from the reserve for each loan default by lower credit quality customers. This has allowed the credit union partner to offer loans to households with credit scores down to 540, but it's really important to note that they have a very that the, that the programs have a very responsible lending partner, um, and strategies like this need to be uh, deployed with with trustworthy lending partners to avoid potential for the potential for abusive lending practices. Next slide. Other programs are are using alternative underwriting criteria, typically strong utility bill repayment, to ID creditworthy borrowers that don't meet traditional uh, lending standards. So the last strategy is really uh, accepting 
uh, that that lower credit lower credit score customers are are in a sense less credit worthy. Uh, this strategy says these folks don't qualify under traditional uh, lending standards, but may actually be just as credit worthy as their as their qualifying peers. Uh, the Green Jobs Green New York program in New York uses a two tiered underwriting approach. Uh, Forty eight percent of applicants are initially rejected using traditional underwriting, which is tier one on that graphic, and then rejected applicants are are initially are, are given uh, the opportunity to submit utility bills and be evaluated through Tier 2 based on their bill payment history. To date, this has improved loan approval rates by about 3%, uh, but the program is working out some process issues that have led to high applicant dropout, uh, and, and this strategy may actually lead to a double-digit increase in, in approval rates, which would be quite meaningful uh, on the margin. Um, while these early results are, are promising, it's important that approaches like this be assessed over time based not just on how many loans are made, uh, but whether such loans ultimately exhibit strong repayment trends to justify approving these borrowers. Next slide. And lastly, uh, innovative financing tools may be more effective at meeting the needs of middle-income households. Uh, On-bill financing may ultimately reduce loan delinquency and that households are used to paying utility bills and increase household willingness to finance efficiency. Uh, you know, again, there is some reluctance to take out debt uh, for these improvements, and, and ultimately on-bill financing looks more like a, a charge on the utility bill than a traditional loan. Uh, where non-payment triggers utility shutoff, on-bill can get around some personal creditworthy issues because borrowers ultimately have a very strong incentive to keep the lights on to pay these bills. Um, that said, this issue is a, is a difficult political one um, in that many, many folks within states are opposed to, to shutting off people's uh, power in the event that they don't pay these bills. Uh, a second tool is the deferred loan. Um, we think that, that some middle-income households, particularly the, the elderly households on fixed incomes, simply don't have the capacity to make consistent loan payments. And a common practice among housing agencies is, is to attach a lien to the property uh, that ultimately must be paid off when the property is sold or otherwise transferred. The challenge with this type of product is that it's very difficult to scale because, because public funds or private funds revolve very slowly. Uh, and lastly, the Clinton Climate Initiative is piloting a model in Arkansas in which a credit union provides the loan capital uh, and then is repaid via pay paycheck deductions that are automatically transferred from, from an employee's paycheck. Uh, the security of this deduction allows the credit union to do more lenient underwriting, even though this is ultimately an unsecured loan, uh, and offer more attractive terms than, than for traditional unsecured loans. And we think this may be a, a particularly compelling approach for middle-income households. With that, I'll transfer it back to Ian. And let me just ask one question, um, Mark. The, um, let's see, David Brightwell is asking, you know, kind of where do you draw the line on <clears throat> where to define the target group? Uh, he says it's no surprise that higher income households have better credit and more ability to pay for EU financing. And if you solve the middle income problem, then what's next? Do you start targeting, you know, the, you know, the moderately wealthy folks? Um, I guess I guess I'm not clear on by solving the middle income problem in terms of access to capital. I think ultimately the 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 solutions, in a sense, in, in the world of financing that are appropriate for middle-income households uh, may more broadly benefit the entire market in terms of delivering uh, more flexible capital or, or uh, more appropriately priced capital uh, into the marketplace. So things like on-bill financing, while they may be particularly effective for middle-income households, uh, we think can drive, in a sense, uh, you know, real, I hesitate to say revolution in financing, but, but can drive meaningful change in financing where we move away hopefully from let's say 15 percent, uh, 15 to 20 percent uh, interest rate unsecured loans uh, into, into you know, closer to, to 7 to 10 percent loans that we think are important both to, to kind of uh, not scaring customers away with sticker shock uh, but also to, to making the private economics of these improvements work better for, for households. Great, thanks. So now Ian's going to talk about the role of policy. All right. Thanks, Marion. Um, so these program approaches that we've uh, we've described so far, they're they're not really enough, in our judgment, on their own to be effective at the at the scale necessary for addressing some of these broad policy goals. And uh, and and so it, we feel as though there there is a there's a need here for some fundamental policy that provides a foundation and some funding for these programs, but also can drive some additional demand and capture savings that voluntary programs 
can't or, 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 or won't. And so if you kind of think of these, uh, these policies that we're going to get into as supporting, complementing, or amplifying some of the strategies we've discussed so far. And, and I you know, also want to emphasize that most of these policies that we're getting into also enhance the resources for delivering energy efficiency in other uh, market segments and in other sectors. Next slide. So these are the four uh, basic classes of uh, policies we're going to get into, and, uh, and, and these include energy savings targets and, and some uh, kind of changes in how we look at uh, these programs through a cost-effectiveness lens, and, uh, and, and codes and standards for, uh, for, for end uses and, and for, for structures. And then we're going to talk about kind of uh, you know, informing the market better and, and, uh, about energy efficiency, making that a little more transparent to uh, to home buyers and renters, and uh, and what kinds of regulations might play off of that. In each of these cases, if you think about that, uh, some of that previous point about you know support, complement, amplify, each of these has some combination of those. And so, in in more than half of the country now, uh, we uh, we have some form of energy savings uh, or spending targets. And there has been, in the last 10 years, a very rapid and sustained proliferation of these, of these mandates. Um, and, and they include savings targets. They include uh, specified levels of savings or statutory requirements for pursuit of all cost-effective savings. And you can see kind of which states have uh, which policies here. This is kind of the, the, uh, the landscape policy-wise. And, and then some of these are statutory. Uh, in the case of uh, generally uh, the uh, energy efficiency resource standards and the all-cost effective standards, and some of them are set by regulators. And some of these are a hybrid. The lawmakers establish mandatory requirements, but the regulators come along and set the actual number of numeric targets uh, you know, with some feedback from the market. And uh, these targets, the importance is that they are far and away the primary driver for the largest source of funding for energy efficiency programs nationwide going forward. Um, Kind of the, the drawback is that the majority of these targets are, are pretty short term, they're one to three years. And so, you know, not coincidentally, the programs that, that uh, are, are, derived, are driven by these uh, targets are, are, are aimed at more immediate savings. So, uh, one key to more comprehensive, deeper, multi measure uh, savings uh, is, is a longer term and, and preferably cumulative targets. And these would encourage program administrators to take a longer view and really nurture the markets necessary to kind of go after those comprehensive savings. Next slide, please. So most of the states uh, require the use of a, uh, of a total resource cost test, the TRC, to screen their utility customer funded energy efficiency programs. And the programs that we're talking about today will probably not be cost effective in the first year and are marginally cost effective after that date. That's just the reality. And how the TRC is applied and what goes into the calculation matters an awful lot about whether or not these uh, programs screen or pencil out. Um, and so if the TRC is applied at the measure level, and we see that in some, in some states, some of them very prominent states in, in the energy efficiency landscape, and, and, and possibly even if you apply the TRC at the program level, um, and if we see kind of the benefits portion of the calculation limited just to energy savings, these programs may just be screened out and not implemented at all. And so we have some suggestions here for, you know, one, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to measure cost effectiveness on a portfolio basis across all of the sectors uh, for, for consumption. And uh, if, if, you, if you can apply cost effectiveness at that level, it makes it a lot easier to access uh, these hard to reach markets, not only in the residential sector, but the other sectors. Um, the report also suggests kind of considering a broader array of benefits in this benefit cost calculation. So not just energy savings, but also quantifiable non-energy benefits, such as defraying the cost of, of meeting new emissions regulations that are coming down the pike and reducing the rearages and disconnections. Um, these, uh, these, avoiding some of these costs means saving millions, even tens of millions of dollars for, uh, for, for utilities every year. 
And so, uh, you know, and, and if you were a, a municipal utility, you might have uh, some some additional interest uh, that would be served by these programs, such as preserving your housing stock, your residential tax base, and deriving some economic development from the work. Um, and so uh, lastly, we, we, uh, as Mark discussed, uh, some of this housing is in poor shape and, and poses some health and safety risk. And, and those uh, often have to be addressed uh, before energy efficiency measures can be installed. And just as with low-income programs, it makes sense to maybe exempt some of these cost components from benefit cost testing and preferably to bring some outside, some other non-cost effectiveness screened resources into play. And so you know, again, these policies provide some support, but also the opportunity to kind of amplify the, uh, the effects of, of the program strategies we discussed earlier. Next slide, please. So uh, codes and standards uh, have the, um, ha ha and, and I'm going to also include in this uh, labeling of, of end uses, such as you know energy star labels. These uh, have a, a very significant potential to complement and amplify the uh, the output of, of these programs, and they can they can access energy savings that programs kind of don't or have trouble tapping, and so they can go into you know geographically into places where programs don't exist or where the implementation is is not exact not cost effective, and they can address some of these end uses that have proven fairly uh, elusive for programs to date, such as plug loads. Now this is the fastest, you know, especially consumer electronics. When you look at the the pie for, for our energy consumption, this is the fastest growing portion of that pie and it's coming close to rivaling the next biggest portion, which is heating. Um, and so I uh, and and something else that codes and standards can do, and this is this is not a fact today, but it's coming down the pike in the not too distant future are these end uses where there's very little consumer choice in play. And so we were talking about some of these set-top boxes that you, know, you get from the cable or satellite, they don't pay the bills. And uh, so codes and standards can help you access uh, some savings from, from that market. Um, and lastly, next slide. We also think that uh, building energy labeling and disclosure and regulations, this has a, a fair amount of potential. Now, there's some uncertainty around, you know, what the impacts are of these labels and and, and the, the information disclosure and upgraded transaction regulations. But at a minimum, these initiatives offer a way to reduce the risk that households will be exposed to high or unexpected energy expenses, and they really bear watching as drivers for program participation. Uh, and and so these come in you know a, a number of different flavors here, you know, labeling and disclosure kind of make these uh, these energy costs the the operating costs on the energy side a lot more visible uh, in in uh, transactions. And so um, and they also op offer an opportunity down the road to be linked up with some regulations and uh, so to trigger some requirements to gather that information to do energy assessments and then to follow on with some work either at sale or at the lease, uh, the execution of the lease, or when you're going out for a, a building permit to do extensive uh, remodeling. And uh, you know, and there's some uh, great examples here that we can, we can uh, go into um, that uh, in Austin, Boulder, Berkeley, uh, we'll uh, We'll uh, save that to Q and A, but uh, again, these fall into, you know, the uh, the category of again complementing and potentially, you know, driving some some demand for these programs, amplifying their their output. And I'll hand it back to Mary. Great, thanks. So, as you guys can tell, that was a very you know high level overview. We went through a lot of these key points quickly, and there's a lot um, underlying them, both key studies programs we looked at, a lot of interviews we did. And in the next, uh, the next three webinars, we hope to kind of dig a bit deeper into the topics um, like driving demand, like financing, et cetera, and draw on program examples from the folks who are actually running these programs to give you a bit more uh, nuance and color about what's going on on the ground. 
So just to kind of summarize the overall themes, you know, we see a lot of progress being made in expanding the residential efficiency markets. We're seeing programs all over the country go from single measure programs and lighting to trying to get more comprehensive multi-measure projects done. Um, and we know from talking to the program administrators that we spoke to, from talking to contractors and policymakers, that the middle income households do have some special needs. They're not exactly the same. You know, people who have half as much income don't necessarily, they're not going to necessarily invest in the same types of things and to the same degree as quickly um, as their higher income peers. And we found that there are really specific things to this market in terms of um, how to market to them. The messengers might be very different in terms of who is going to be able to reach this segment. Um, their access to credit is going to be different, and they may require additional subsidy or additional support um, to get them uh, the ability to invest. And they often have many more structural issues in their homes besides just the efficiency. And many times, these structural I issues make it impossible or very difficult to actually do the efficiency measures. Um, and then finally, um, the strategies that we highlight throughout the report and throughout this presentation are really important. They're a great start. There's a lot of things that programs can do. Um, and it's going to probably also require some complementary policies um, to really reach a scale within the residential market um, within all, all of the market segments. So those are, those are kind of our key points for this presentation. Um, I just want to make sure everyone knows uh, the resources we have available, middleincome.lbl.gov. We put up information about registering for future webinars. The report itself, um, the presentation will be up there later. Um, and these are the webinars that we have um, coming up. Um, and now I just want to go to a number of questions that we have from, from the audience. Um, I'm just going to go through them in order because they kind of jump uh, to a number of different topics. Um, so let's start. Uh, Mark, I think this is a question for you. You mentioned the APS program in Arizona um, with the 10% savings and a retrofit cost of about $3,000. Are these programs cost effective, and kind of what's their payback? Can you give us some sense of what the program looks like in terms of, uh, of, of their, their return on investment? Yeah, I guess cost effective for, for whom is the question. I'm going to assume that you're, that you're referring to the, the actual program participant. Uh, and if you, if you kind of at high level look at this as, as a kind of $200 uh, a, dollar a month uh, on average uh, utility bill market and assume that you're getting uh, ten percent savings off of that, I think you end up with uh, just north of a ten year payback uh, and that's that's without any uh, additional financial incentive from from the utility or otherwise uh, and so so these these do in a sense pencil out um, as you as you look at the life of the improvements so you know these are improvements that that are likely to last for you know ten fifteen twenty years um, but these are not you know three year payback types of improvements and I think that the challenge as we move uh, away from these single measure improvements, as Marion talked about, into these multi-measure programs, uh, is that without um, kind of more robust public support, uh, in some sense, some of these improvements are going to be difficult to get to, to pencil out based just on the private benefits. Um, you know, I guess I, I think the other thing to, to note is that in a lot of places, um, you know, when we look at cost effectiveness. We'll, we'll look at just the efficiency. So if, if folks are replacing an HVAC system, from a, from a public cost effectiveness standpoint, we'll look just at the efficient component um, of that HVAC system. But from a private benefit uh, standpoint, you know, in a sense, folks had to replace their HVAC systems. And so we don't need, uh, from a private benefit perspective, for, for uh, the efficiency of these measures to pay for the full cost of the improvement. What we'd like to see is that the, that the efficiency component uh, and, the, and the savings are, are sufficient to pay for that, that kind of isolated efficiency component of it. And just from a program perspective as well, from talking with the program administrators in Arizona, I know that that program does um, pass the, the cost effectiveness test that the utilities are required to pass for their programs. So it does, not with flying colors, not you know two to one, but you know it, it actually is passing the test there. Um, so it, it's working, but but you know we got several comments on this, and, and the point is well taken that you know some of these improvements are going to be just on the edge, yeah. um, in terms of their payback, in some cases. You know, if if I can add to a you know we also see programs like this pencil out uh, very well on the gas side, and uh, particularly where you have joint gas and electric programs, uh, where you're kind of splitting the incentives and and uh, splitting up the savings. We, we uh, those. Those uh, tend to have somewhat higher cost-effectiveness values than uh, than gas or electric by themselves. Yeah. 
So another question that, that came in from Seth, um, I think this is really for Mark. So he says, you refer to credit unions frequently. Um, what portion of EE loans come from credit unions compared to the other sources of capital, mm. like banks, loan funds, et cetera? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, most of these, so there have been lots of energy efficiency financing programs that have been launched in conjunction with the Recovery Act. Um, and generally what we found is that local financial institutions in the form of local banks, uh, local credit unions, local CDFIs or community development financial institutions have been offering far more compelling terms in terms of, uh, in terms of interest rate, uh, loan length, and, and percent of uh, uh, applicants that they're kind of willing to improve uh, than national lenders uh, have. So standard national uh, unsecured lending products, uh, you know, again, in that 15 to 20 percent um, interest rate range, and oftentimes these local lenders, either because they have uh, a, a real um, social kind of interest that's, that's driving, uh, social mission that's driving their, their broad portfolio of investments, uh, or because they see uh, efficiency loans as a really attractive way uh, to drive customer demand because they're getting access to generally high credit quality customers initially. They are uh, funding more of the approved loans, and then they're cross-selling uh, those loans at higher rates than their other kind of standard products. And so they're getting access to this unique population. So uh, I think it's difficult to put a, a number on what percent of, of loans are being originated locally versus nationally, uh, but certainly we've seen a lot of the innovation happening uh, at the local level. I think this raises, um, just to go on for a second, some, some big issues about uh, how we scale this market through time. Um, it's pretty clear that today, with demand levels uh, as they are, that these local financial institutions are in a position, position generally to, to kind of meet the demand for, for capital that, that the market is, is demanding. But, but over time, if, this, if, if efficiency markets in the residential sector scale uh, in the way that they hope they will, uh, we're going to ultimately need bigger pools of capital than those that are, that are simply you know, offered by, uh, by local lenders. Uh, and then the question becomes, when and how do we transition the local, the innovative local lending that we're seeing today uh, into more standardized, hopefully more accessible financing uh, that can then be aggregated uh, in either uh, you know, secondary markets, and in a sense uh, uh, a toxic uh, phrase today, but, but ultimately um, aggregated and, and removed from the banks or from the balance sheets of, of local uh, and or national lenders so that they can effectively be uh, originating and servicing these these financings but not ultimately holding them uh, on their balance sheets. Great, thanks. Um, and then a question from Jim. Are there any programs considering the economic value of societal or environmental benefits such as improved health um, or lower emissions in terms of the total cost effectiveness of these, these types of improvements? And maybe I can I can yeah, actually just I, I, I think we we do see some kind of best in class examples out there that uh, you know we we can uh, kind of send your way after this call, but uh, it, we we see some um, fairly expansive and well grounded uh, non energy benefit quantification in the Pacific Northwest and then in some other uh, parts of the country where. You know, regulators have provided some some very fairly detailed guidance uh, to regulated entities on on what should be included, and so we do see you know in particular uh, avoidance of cost or risk on the on the uh, emissions side. We see a fair amount of kind of countenancing down the road some exposure to uh, to carbon regulatory risk. Um, you see, you know, again some wrapping in of these of these health and safety issues. Um, you know, particularly in the low-income programs, uh, but um, you know, by and large, you know, most of what we're talking about hasn't necessitated uh, folks going out and taking into account some of these, you know, kind of softer or less uh, easily quantified private uh, benefits out there. But really, uh, there, there's a, a very extensive literature out there on on these uh, quantifiable public benefits, and it's not altogether clear that the that uh, the majority of, of states and utilities out there have have uh, kept up to speed on that on that literature and the quantification. Great, and we have another question um, 
to what extent have you found the success of energy upgrades for middle income tier associated with an active like local nonprofit that is working with households to address their credit issues and to help them get to the place where they are attractive to a lender? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So some of the more innovative lenders that we that we spoke with um, were uh, community development financial institutions, very experienced uh, with working in, in working with um, both income qualified households and households with poor credit. Uh, and so the efficiency loans uh, are one of of a number of products that these lenders offer. Um, it, that, that are offered in a sense to solve problems, but also with this goal um, of building a customer's credit. And so in some cases, uh, these lenders will require that customers participate in basic financial education classes um, that, that depending on, on which institution you talk to, have a meaningful impact on, on uh, the repayment rate of the specific financing um, that they've taken out, uh, but also help to more broadly move these customers out of a position where they're in need of public assistance or, or uh, assisted lending uh, and into a more uh, financeable kind of bracket of, of customers that's qualifying for traditional uh, unsecured and secured lending products. Could, could we add there I said also, you know, these are, these are points for education as well on the, on the energy efficiency benefits. And so, you know, to the degree that, uh, you know, you, you do see some programs out there that combine energy efficiency education with credit counseling, and those uh, have uh, significant problems. Okay, and we have a question from uh, Becky in California. She asks, uh, do you see a way to link the strategies for middle income, which in general we've been talking about sort of uh, doing the basics and that sort of thing, to the drive for more comprehensive whole house approaches, either at the time of that project or over a longer time period? Yeah, so uh, this is a great question, and I think the you know the answer is that the the jury is is very much out on this. Um, I think what we're seeing today is that there's a real reluctance, particularly in the middle income uh, household segment, which is really it's it's a tough uh, segment in a sense to to kind of put singular descriptions around. But but we're seeing a real reluctance reluctance in that in that uh, market segment to make these these deep comprehensive uh, upgrades at least all at once. And so the question today is. Uh, do you do you offer more uh, more basic improvements to get folks in the door and hope that 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 engagement will create an ongoing that single engagement will create an ongoing relationship where each time they're having to make a replacement um, you either have a contractor relationship or a program relationship or an educated consumer that is that is making sure that they're installing the most efficient uh, HVAC unit or or uh, heat pump or, or or whatever it whatever it may be. But there are big questions out there um, that, that remain unresolved about whether this strategy will ultimately be effective. You know, in a sense, these basic packages are are uh, involve installing the the most cost-effective improvements. And so, by not doing a large package at the at the get-go, uh, you you miss this cross subsidization where the where the really cost-effective improvements um, aren't. Um, subsidizing, in a sense, the less cost-effective improvements and giving you an overall package of, of um, very strong payback. And, and there are big questions about what that means for re, you know, moving from, let's say, 10% savings initially to 30 to 40% savings or whatever the kind of public policy goal is uh, down the line in the next 5 to 10 to 15 years. We have another question here um, that's really kind of, uh, kind of reflecting back the point that we made about there's a huge market up, up there about improvements being made every day, you know, new, new HVAC systems, uh, new roofs, et cetera. For the HVAC system in particular, um, this audience member is, is kind of concerned that most people don't connect a new furnace to doing efficiency. <clears throat> and at some point, um, everyone's going to need a new furnace or a new AC unit, depending on where you live. Mm -hmm. And are there any efforts to really um, make efficiency happen at, right at that moment when, when, when they are being sold a new furnace? And kind of linked to that, um, this, this audience member is suggesting that there may need to be a lot of education in advance so consumers consumer start to think about efficiency at that moment and not just from kind of the contractor, not just depending on the contractor to sell it uh, at yeah. the time of sale. Yeah. On that? 
Yeah, so, the, so there's one major effort um, in Pennsylvania today called, this is the Keystone Health Program. We, we actually referred to some of their, uh, their loan participation um, in, the, in the presentation. But Keystone Health uh, is targeted at those, inter, at those key intervention points where folks are replacing, uh, in, in the middle of February, their boiler goes out and they're, they're replacing their boiler. Uh, and the financing is discounted for more efficient units uh, and even more discounted for folks that move beyond just that single measure replacement uh, into more comprehensive multi-measure approaches like air sealing and insulation. Um, generally, what we found is that the program is, is fairly um, popular among both contractors and participants because the financing, low-cost financing, is fairly easy to sell. Um, but that the program has not generally been successful in moving participants away from that single measure replacement into multi-measure upgrades uh, at that time of sale. So something on the order of 90% of, uh, of the participants in the program have simply done that single measure uh, replacement. Um, you know, this program is primarily tar targeted at that reactive consumer. So in a sense, they're using the intervention point as an education uh, opportunity rather than kind of being out there in the marketplace proactively um, you know, in a sense, educating consumers that that when that time comes, um, you know, this is this is a real option and something they should pursue. So the contractors, in a sense, end up being the driving uh, the the drivers of kind of sales and program participation in Pennsylvania. And and there there are folk programs and and folks kind of across the country that are that are looking at that model fairly closely. I think we're going to end um, our program there um, right at time, right on time. Um, uh, as we mentioned before, we have several webinars coming up. Um, they're on this page here so that you can see on your screen. Um, go to middleincome.lbl.gov to get information about registering for those webinars. And also really feel free to contact Mark or Ian if you have additional questions of, that come up uh, as you read through our materials and kind of think through the webinar today. Um, so I just want to thank everyone uh, for their time. We had a, a nice large group on the call, and we really appreciate uh, your time and attention and uh, are really open to questions and feedback um, and any additional discussion going forward. So thanks a lot.